Hello, I'm Martin Hindley, and this is the Champions Rugby Show, where we're celebrating 25 years of what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. Our guest today is one of the most special rugby talents that Ireland has ever produced. And now it's Keith Earls. He is holding the seat right side. And what a finish that is by Simon Siebel. Try number three for Munster. He's high up on the try-scoring leaderboard in the Heineken Champions Cup. He's played for almost a decade for a brilliant Munster rugby side, making it to four European Cup semi-finals. And he's currently playing his trade in Paris with Racing, where he's hoping to create his very own slice of European history in the near future. Joining me today, it's a privilege to say, is Simon Zebo. Simon, how are you? Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. You had a big birthday back in, in March at the start of this. How were the celebrations and, and how are you feeling during these, uh, let's say, unprecedented times? Yeah, I did. I, I uh, luckily turned 30 and um, I was able to, to spend my birthday with um, my family in lockdown. Um, so, yeah, my fiance and my kids made it a very special day for me and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. That's the way I, I actually kind of like birthdays. So it was actually quite good, but... Being on lockdown, you know, it's not easy for everyone. And um, we've been enjoying it for the most part. But, yeah, looking forward to getting back to action now. How has the, the France experience been for you? We'll talk on the pitch in a moment. But but as a family uh, and as an experience, I mean, how has it been for you so far? Oh, so far, it's been incredible. Everything we thought it would be, you know, it's been amazing. Um, we're so lucky to meet the people we've met and make some great memories as a family and see some amazing places and and th- and that's just from a lifestyle perspective, you know. And then from the rugby, you know, you you have a, a totally different way of looking at things, I suppose, from what I would have been used to. And, and to come into a setup like this has been refreshing for sure. We're here to discuss your your story and what is now the the Heineken Champions Cup. But for a start, what does the tournament mean to you as a player and as a rugby man? As a rugby man, I suppose I start just because it's it gives you so much excitement, you know, as a fan of the game, you know, um, Heineken Cup weekends, Heineken Champions Cup weekends are special and um, you, you really get in behind it and, and you can support the teams that you follow with your friends and things like that. It's just uh, such a special competition. And um, for me personally, as a player, it's always been my favourite competition to play in. Um, I think it's an incredibly special trophy with a lot of history. All the best players in the world have, have played in the Champions Cup and there's been some incredible matches that will live long in the in the memories of fans, you know, and uh, to be able to add your own little piece of, of history to this special tournament any time you get to go out and play is a lucky position to be in. Well, you've added several slices of history. We're going to go back uh, through some of those, but how did it feel taking you right back to the start in, in signing your, your contract with, with Munster, a club with... With such a, let's say, such a, a big slice of that history, it's part of the fabric of, of the province, um, the European Cup. How did it feel to be signed and what were your, your first memories of joining such a, a juggernaut of, of European rugby? Um, all of my memories, my first memories of that was incredible. You know, I had uh, not, not such an easy road to, to get to become a professional rugby player and to have eventually signed with, with such a an amazing franchise or team or club like Munster was a dream come true because I'd grown up watching Ronan O'Gara and, and Paul O'Connell, Peter Clossy, all, all these legends who had played for Munster and all your friends want to play for Munster. So when you finally get the opportunity to sign a contract and become a professional rugby player, it's, it's like making all your dreams come true. You were playing alongside so many players in their prime uh, at the start. That must have been such an inspiration. And when it came to your Heineken Cup debut for Munster against Scarlets, that must have been a, a very special moment in, in your career. What do you remember about that match and, and finally to be playing on the, the big stage in Europe? Oh, that was so special. Because for me, as I said, the Heineken Champions Cup has always been my favourite tournament. And Growing up in Munster, you know how electric the crowds get for those European games. So for the first time to be able to run out on the pitch and experience the atmosphere and the pressure of the game and everything, and it was incredible. It was, that was properly a dream come true. And I'll never forget that day. But uh, a few things from that day, I think, I, I, if I remember correctly, I scored a disallowed try, which could have been uh, a nice start to the game, but wasn't to be. But um yeah, I just remember, I think we all played particularly well that day and um, a great day. 
Many players talk about the atmosphere at Thoman Park for a European Cup match and everything just going up a notch. But in a build-up to a, a European match, how how did it change back in those days from a league match to going into Europe? How did it change for you as as a group of players? Massively, it changed. It, the whole week was completely different. It just went from being another game to the most important game of the season, you know, as soon as Monday came around. So it was very special to be a part of, to, you know, that kind of the old guard mentality in Munster and how they approach games was really um, fascinating to come into as a youngster. And, you know, the importance and uh, the value of the Heineken Champions Cup was really put on display when you're a youngster in that group. So, yeah, it was just a, an immediate pressure, you know, almost when, you, when you're when you playing with Munster and European rugby, there's a pressure on us to perform and, and to do well. And they were probably the main things that stuck out for me, yeah. You opened your European Cup scoring account with a hat-trick against Northampton Saints and you became the first player ever to score two hat-tricks in the tournament in the, the season, uh, scoring three of Munster's five tries against your, your current club, Racing, who are, of course have become familiar foes down the years. As you were named Young Player of the Year for, for Munster in that season in 12-13, did you realise that you were joining that elite group of special European players that you mentioned that you'd looked up to as you joined the club? I don't know. I definitely didn't at the time. And, you know, I, and I didn't even realise that that stat that I had scored hat-tricks in that same season or calendar year um, until later. So to have edged my first little piece of history was very, very special for me. Yeah. And yeah, it was just an incredible moment, to be honest. Yeah, there was lots of memories that, um, you know, just added to that book where, you can just look back on and be very proud of. How much more of this pressure can Northampton Saints take in this last four minutes? And the answer is they can take no more. And it's the hat-trick hero, Simon Jago. You made it to four semi-finals in the Heineken Champions Cup. Which of those sides did you believe that you were the closest to lifting that elusive third trophy for the province? I think uh, when we played probably Toulon away in Marseille, I thought that was a game we should have won. I thought Johnny Wilkinson played really, really well that day. He he hit some important kicks and hit a late drop goal, I think, to get it out of way, eight points plus or something like that. But I thought that day, uh, I thought we had our tails up and there was a point in the game where... I think if we gotten a kick, we could have gone two scores ahead or, you know, into the lead even with uh, 10 minutes to go. And that would have been a totally different picture, I think, from chasing the game all, all game. So that was a game yeah, that if you had a second chance to, to go back and, and take, that would probably be the game. We spoke at the start of this series with uh, Stefan Armitage and Brian Habana, both speaking about that Toulon side of the era. And they both uh, pointed to the monster side as being the side that they respected. Did you feel the respect of the opponents uh, when you went onto the field for the, the remarkable achievements that Munster Rugby have given the European Cup down the years? Was that something that as players you could sense? Completely, yeah. You could totally sense that, and not just from the players, from the fans as well. Um, I remember after that game, we were doing a lap of honour and all the Toulon fans stayed back uh, to applaud the Munster fans and, and started cheering, you know, and the monster players, sorry. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it was incredibly special, you know. They, but the funny thing is they'd be respecting the elder statesmen, you know, more so than uh, any of the young boys coming through. So you know that when you're in a team with Paul O'Connell, Ronan O'Gara, Doug Howlett, these guys, that uh, you're going to have the opposition's respect because, you know, um, on any given day, there's no team that, that you couldn't beat. You mentioned a lot of legends there, and we'll touch upon another one here. Um, the man who lifted the trophy um, for Munster and who sadly we lost at the start of the 2016-17 season, uh, Axel Anthony Foley. What did he mean to you and to the club when it came to the European Cup? Wow, uh, he was. Yeah, there, I, I, I wouldn't do it justice, you know trying to say what he meant to me as a person because I had him, uh, I would have looked up to him firstly when when I was a player and or while he was a player and secondly then when he became a coach he, he was able to, I was lucky enough to have him as a coach under 20 level at Munster and from there we, we continued rising through the ranks, him as a coach and, and me as a player to the senior team at Munster and yeah we had a really strong relationship 
Anthony loved to have fun, just like myself. So, so we had a good band, and um, you know, he he had for a, a man had such wisdom and knowledge of the game, and the only thing he cared about was Monster Rugby and his family. You know, so um, a very very passionate man, and he meant so much to to Monster. But the Champions Cup too, he is Monster's all time top try scorer in the Champions Cup, and he's the highest scoring forward I think in the champions that's right champions 23 world. tries yeah absolutely yeah, so you know he's a legend of the game not just in Ireland but in Europe uh, and he's greatly missed and he won't be forgotten anytime soon around Munster in Ireland absolutely there's so many um, so many poignant moments that came in the the replayed match uh, against Racing and the Racing club showed immense respect to to his memory that must have been very special to to come together as two clubs and especially for you now having represented the the badge of of both of them that that must be be something that for you is in the the fabric not just of the clubs but of rugby as a sport is that fair to say Hugely, yeah. It's a good part of the culture that we have in rugby and um, there's a great camaraderie, there's a great bond even between rivals and that respect is always there, you know, and that's that's what makes me not only proud to wear, have worn Munster and wear Racing, but to, to play the game we play. So, yeah, I think, you know, Racing have always had a touch of class about them, you know, and when we were over in Paris with Munster, they went above and beyond to make sure that they let the monster fans and players and everything know that they were there for us, you know, and it's way more than a game. So the relationship with wrestling started off on a, on a sad note, but a, a good one, a positive in terms of, you know, when I signed to come with them, I knew that I was going to a good club and, um, you know, full of good people. And, you know, I, I long may I continue. How did it come about then for, for you to sign for wrestling and, and how difficult was it for you to make the decision to leave Munster? It was, it was very difficult incredibly difficult actually um, because I have all my family and my uh, loved ones back in Ireland and I have you know Munster my team growing up it's like growing up supporting Liverpool and changing club you know when when you're a player or something so it's you know it's a very tough thing to do and um, you know I always wanted to do it at some stage during my career I always loved the idea of paving my own way and having my career the way I wanted it to pan out and, and coming to France was a part of that and certain things played out in the favour of me coming to France and, and, and I made the decision to do and and uh, I haven't looked back since it's been incredible but you know going back to play Monster and Tom and Park and you know seeing a couple of games throughout the year on, on TV over here it's been tough but uh, I'm very very happy where I am and, and really enjoying my rugby. Well, that last season uh, with Munster, you were a part of the first 15 to take to the field against them. And at the time, the brand new U Arena and watching pre-match, Conor Murray hit halfway up the screen, kicking uh, range kicking from his own half before the match. We already knew that it was going to be a very, very different experience. What were your first thoughts when you first walked into that arena in the in the red of Munster? I thought, wow, this stadium is ridiculous. <laughs> um, it's going to be fun to play in here. The second thing then was, you know, just trying to, because traditionally the generation that I've played with Monster, we haven't had a great track record of going to France and um, getting the away win. You know, the generation before us had great track record, but us not so much. So we, I, I think we were, we were confident, but uh, there's still that underlying thing there that we uh, just couldn't get over the line, you know, and uh, we played quite well that day. Keith Earl scored a scorcher of a try and, we were right in the game until Donica Ryan, you know, won back a restart for them. You know, like a, it was like a miracle, to be honest, for Racing. I don't know how he did it, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, very impressive. And, and, and their clash showed in the end and they were just able to, to tip the scale. But I just remember being wowed by the stadium and, you know, we put it up to them that day, but just wasn't enough. You've played regularly on 4G pitches and, and the like, but what is the most difficult thing to get used to as a player for playing in that very, very specific and particular environment in what is now the, the Paris La Défense Arena? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one because the Paris La Défense Arena is completely different to like any other 4G surface I've played with because they have a special mix, you know, it's it's like half hybrid, half 4G, the natural grass sprinkled in there somewhere, you know, they... Um, it doesn't feel like you're playing, you know, uh, uh, in Scotston or in uh, Alliance Park, you know, these traditional 4G pitches that, you know, if it bounces, it'll go a completely different way. So 
I think we have that little bit of give that helps it uh, simulate a real a real surface. So um, it's definitely exciting. It's obviously a lot faster than a normal surface when it's wet and things like that. You're always going to have good conditions. Kickers are happy. And the fans are happy too. They know they won't get changed if they come watch again. So it's uh, it's incredible to play on the surface with the likes of Finn and Virini Vakatawa and Teddy Thoma and, and Juanim off these guys, you know. We just have to, a lot of threats around the pitch, so we get quick ball and it's fun to play on. Well, after that uh, first experience that you had there, you, you went and beat Cast in a delayed match the, the following week. You earned a, a home quarter final at, at Toman Park against... Too long. Another team of, of special individuals still at that time. And as I mentioned that match, I can still hear Michael Corcoran's commentary of Andrew Conway's try at the end. How on earth did you get out of jail in that match? And what are your memories uh, of that too long quarterfinal? Yeah, I, I, I remember getting getting quite lucky at the beginning of the game. I, I had a little uh, clash with Chris Ashton that um, fortunately Nigel gave a decision our way. And then um, shortly after, you know, Toulon put on the squeeze and they continued the squeeze. And I remember um, getting a bang in the leg. I think actually in that clash with Chris Ashton and I couldn't play anymore. I had to come off. So it was, um, wasn't ideal. But thankfully, Andrew Conway to save the day, you know, it's a... Uh, an excellent counter attack and uh, great pace and footwork that got us through. Conway has it all inside the 20 oh. down. He's going to raise it. He's going forward with this. And Andrew Conway. Oh, he's got it for the try. Andrew Conway with the try for Munster. The disappointment that followed that in, in Bordeaux in the, the semi final on that baking hot day as, as Racing produced um, such an incredible start. Was it a, a bittersweet feeling to you to, to feel the disappointment on one side and to see the strength of the outfit that you were going to join? Yeah, it was. You know, it was, it was kind of more frustration, I, I, I'd say, than anything because I should have been playing, you know, um, uh, and to kind of see the boys out there and not being able to contribute, you know, when, you know, I knew how much I could have contributed. It was, it was very frustrating. So, um, yeah, I think it would have just been frustration at the end. I wasn't, I was so angry, sorry. I wasn't looking forward to playing with any of those wrestling players after that game. Uh, I didn't want to see any of them. So frustration, definitely frustration and anger. You scored uh, in the second half of that match one of 29 tries that you've contributed to what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. Only three players ahead of you on the list, Chris Ashton, Vincent Clair and Brian O'Driscoll. Have you really realised the significance of the contribution that you've given to the, the history of the tournament? No, uh, not not too much. But when you put it like that, it's, it's very uh, nice to hear. Uh, and thank you. But yeah, I, I saw... Well, I, I knew rather that I was, um, you know, quite high up the list. And it's, yeah, as I said, it's my favourite games to play in my, the Heineken Champions Cup. So I'm always trying to score. I'm always trying to make an impact on the game, even more so than any any other game, you know. And uh, to be where I am in that position, still playing, uh, it's something that excites me. And, you know, I want to continue chasing the number one spot and trying to help my team lift the trophy ultimately. So, uh not something to dwell on too much now, but uh, when I look back, I suppose I can tell my kids a little bit more about it. Murray starting to open up. Zebo Owls to his left. Zebo Maybe too late, but it is Munster, so maybe not. If I were to ask you, what, what is the key to being a top-class finisher in European club rugby tournaments? What, is there anything in particular that you would say you've developed or any part of your game that you think is absolutely key to, to contributing to those, those 29 tries? Well, for, for me, uh, it would probably be belief you know, and confidence because there's such classy players who are playing on the pitch against you and with you. You have to, you have to be at the top of your game and if you don't believe or if you're not confident that you can go out and try things, even if the pressure is still high, then I don't think you'll get quite high up the list, you know. And, and everybody is who, who is high up that list, I know for sure, is, is confident and will back themselves no matter how high the pressure gets. Um, you see, the, the difference with this in international rugby is that the, the European level, you're playing with, you know, the same calibre of players, but they're training with each other week in, week out, you know, so they're... Their unity, I suppose, or their collective is probably even a little bit stronger, you know. So some champ Heineken Champions Cup games can be even more difficult to win than international. So the pressure is huge. And I think the confidence and belief, whether you're a youngster or um, an elder statesman, I think that would be a huge thing if you wanted to, to get up that list. 
I was lucky enough to be at La Défense Arena in the quarterfinal last season against Toulouse, which has to be one of the, the greatest club matches that the tournament uh, has ever seen. With the back line that you mentioned, not to mention what a, what a sensational uh, pack that Racing has as well. What do you think that the club can achieve when rugby returns? Everything. I don't think there's any reason why we can't. You know, um, the players we have, you know, the names on the team sheet is, is great, but... That you know the the camaraderie, the bond, the the team spirit that's in the in the group is incredible, you know, and it's certainly not like that in every French club. But it's great because we have a great balance between international and French in the style of our play. And yeah, there's no reason why we shouldn't be in two finals at the end of of each year, you know. And they're the standards we set, and um, that's what we fully expect each year. So it's um it's a great mentality to be involved in. You mentioned the camaraderie. That's one thing that really hits you when you come off the field as a group of players. You come off as a as a group. Um, that's something that that must be really really hard to achieve with such a, a star studded lineup. But it does seem that you you all get on as, as as friends really, as as mates as well as colleagues. Unbelievably well, yeah. And it doesn't matter the mix. You know, you you see Fijian boys hanging out with the French lads. You you see it's just a complete mix all the time. You know, and we're always doing things together we all live in the same area really there's not too many lads live in the center of Paris so we're, we share the same social circles and um, yeah we have a great bond on and off the pitch and obviously form ebbs and flows but when it's crunch time generally uh, rationing in the conversation and when we're just trying to get over that hump I suppose the last year or two and uh, get to those two finals that we said that uh, we believe we should be in. Racing have made it to two finals of the, the European Cup in the past four years, had the misfortune of coming up against an exceptional Saracen side in, in Lyon and uh, a pretty handy Leinster team in, in Bilbao as well. So that's a trophy that still eludes the club, but it feels like there's a sense that any kind of missing link and the, the, the misfortune uh, that they had in both finals in the halfback positions, basically, with a bit of luck, is it a side that's good enough to be European champion one day? Definitely. Um, and that's the goal in the immediate future. I I think, yeah, we've got a great balance to our squad. And obviously, you need a little bit of luck, but there, there's no reason why why we shouldn't. And um, we're very, very excited by the challenge. It's, it's a club where the top 14 isn't held on a pedestal. You know, they're both right next to each other. And for me, it would be, you know, the Champions, Heineken Champions Cup is this extra special one, um, having came from where I came from but to lift it one day would be an absolute dream come true and I, I think I, I, my best opportunity right now would be with, with Racing and, um, or the best opportunity I'll have in my career would be now hopefully I get to do it because if I if I don't that would probably be a one regret that I'd, I'd have I'd imagine uh, We're coming towards the end of this uh, really special Champions Rugby show Simon um, what do you think will be the hardest thing for you to get back into the, the training and regular training and then playing matches once once rugby starts up again what's what's going to be the toughest thing from your side? Um, I think the toughest thing will probably just to, to find the groove on the pitch again and to uh, start running nice lines off of you know, Finn and Vermi out of instinct again, you know, because you can't just pick off immediately where you left off, you know. So just building those relationships back up as quickly as possible to, to hit the ground running when rugby starts will be the, will be the challenge. Simon, I've really enjoyed this, this look back and this look forward to your career in the Heineken Champions Cup. Thank you for joining us on the Champions Rugby Show. And when it all comes back together, we wish you all the best. And uh, for that life that sounds so idyllic in, in Paris as well, we wish you and your family all the very best as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a million, guys. Thanks for having me on. Great to speak to Racing Simon Zebo, the former Munster man who's targeting the number one spot on the all-time European Cup try-scoring list. Please subscribe and rate our Champions Rugby Show podcast. Leave us a little review as well if you liked it. We've got another European legend coming up shortly to tell you their story from a quarter of a century of Club Rugby's greatest tournament. See you soon from me and all the team. Goodbye. Goodbye.